Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dean Carlin and Jacob Appel of Innovations for Poverty Action. Um, Dean is the president and the founder of IPA. Uh, they're a group that's doing very impressive work in measuring the effectiveness of aid dollars and using that knowledge to figure out how to design aid programs that have really good bang for the buck. Uh, currently in the aid world, a lot of aid programs are evaluated on their effectiveness by figuring out, well, we had $5 million. Did we spend it all? Yes. Great. We're effective. Um, but you don't really know, did you get $5 million worth of aid for that? Or in fact, did you do more harm than good with that? Um, Dean and uh, Jacob have written a, a book called More Than Good Intentions. They, uh, they talk about uh, what goes into designing their aid experiments and some of the surprisingly small differences and some of the, the very little things that one can do uh, to make aid more effective and uh, to get a lot more aid for a lot fewer dollars. Uh, please welcome Dean Carlin and Jacob Appel. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Thanks a lot for, for coming. Um, and thanks, Eric, for putting this on and, and hosting. So there's a few different themes to what I want to talk about that are, that are re related but might, might sound very different. Um, the, the first theme that I want to talk about is exactly what Eric said, which is how do we, what are we doing to take data to help figure out what really works and what does not? What is, what is this journey about? What is it that we're doing differently than what's been done before? The second thing I want to talk about is how we're thinking about designing some of the programs and interventions that we're, that we're looking into. And specifically, a lot of the work we're doing uses lessons from behavioral economics, but not always behavioral. Sometimes it's just plain vanilla economics. This is one of the themes in the book, too. And we go back and forth between behavioral and more traditional economics, mixing the two up and to understand, in a given situation, what's the, what's the right way of thinking about how to solve a particular, particular problem. The, the, third, the third theme that we'll talk about, and, and Jake will, will come up and speak about as well, has to do with how, how do we sift through all of this information that's out there. This is something near and dear to all of us here in, at Google, obviously, is you know, tons and tons of information can come flooding to us about different charities and doing different work. How do we sift through that to figure out what actually, um, what actually works? So sometimes I, I think it, it helps um, to be, be a little bit personal for a moment. And let me tell you about how I got into doing this. In 1992, I just finished two years of investment banking, and I moved to El Salvador. I was heading from there. I was going to go back to get an MBA, probably go work in a hedge fund or something of that nature. And I took a detour, a detour for a year to work for an organization that this is pre-internet days, that I had seen a brochure about. And it seemed very appealing to me and very attractive. It really hit my, it both hit my heart and my mind, but not my mind in a data sense, my mind in the sense that the theory of what they were doing made sense to me. And what they were doing was microcredit. Now, what's the canonical microcredit story? The canonical microcredit story says, we're, we're going to take money and we're going to lend it out to women who have enterprising ideas and are entrepreneurial or high energy are really motivated to do something about the problem they're facing in their life, the poverty that they're stricken with. And they're doing this to, in order to fight for their family, for their children, um, to improve the health and education of their children. It's a very inspiring story that we've heard probably many, I'm, I'm guessing many people in the room have heard this story told this way. You know, here was I, I was coming from a banking background and this, this seemed perfect, right? And uh, in banking, I had some computer backgrounds. So I went down and I was developing software systems for managing their portfolios. The thing that struck me the most was the conversations at night. So talking with people who were working with this group, and a lot of people in this group, you know, very smart people, but not, not, not using any sort of data to help guide what they were doing. And, and I remember asking, what is the impact of this? What do, we, what do we think is happening with the impact here? The first thing that struck me when I moved to El Salvador was what the interest rate was. Right? So in this brochure that I saw that inspired me to move to El Salvador to do this, there was no mention of the interest rate. And if you had asked me, I would have said, well, you know, it, it, I understand the principle here is kind of sustainable development. There has to be some revenue, so there's probably going to be some nominal interest rate fee of 5%, 10%. It turns out it was 72% a year, the interest rate. And, you know, my first reaction was I was kind of disheartened. I, I remember the feeling of my heart sinking and thinking, what's going on here? Now, 
that sounds bad, but it, you know, then we sat down and we talked with some of the, the clients who were engaging this program and we asked them the types of things that we saw them doing and how they were maybe doing something differently as getting access to the loan. It wasn't actually that hard to come up with returns that high. Returns that high for a microenterprise could actually be reasonably that high. So it's, that's not actually enough to say, just looking at that interest rate is by no means enough to say, oh, this is a bad idea. Now, when we asked the organization, what is your impact? This is what they gave us. They gave us a study that asked their existing clients who had been with them for a couple years, are you eating better now than you were two years ago? Okay, and, and that was it. That was, that was the extent. And then they, some other questions too. Are you, are you earning more in your business? Right? And this was, the, this was the state of what they were doing in terms of impact measurement. They were not doing anything different, I have now learned, than anybody else in this space. So this is not a criticism of them. This is, this is a statement of where the world was in terms of it measuring impact of microcredit. Now, you know, I had a major in political science. It didn't take, it didn't take a, you know, it didn't take training to just kind of say, okay, well, now wait a second. The world is happening at the same time. So did, is, is it, can we really say that microcredit caused these people to be eating better and earn more money? Or could it be the macroeconomic conditions? Could it be just weather was good? Could it just be that they were in, a, in, a, in an upward trajectory anyhow because they're individuals who were chosen because they are fighting individuals, inspiring individuals, entrepreneurial individuals. That's what the brochure said. That's who they're lending to. Right, so what is it that caused them to do better? So I remember thinking at the time that, you know, what else could we put into this and, and claim microcredit causes? Imagine that survey also said, are you feeling older now than you were two years ago? Would we go and, and then take this to the, the brochures and say microcredit causes aging, right? The, the, the rigor of that conclusion would have been just as solid as the rigor of the conclusion that they caused an increase in income. So the, the point of this is that, you know, we need to have some basis of attribution, right? This, we need to know whether our aid is doing something and we need to, when we want to ask that question, what we really are asking is, how have the lives of the people in a program changed compared to how their lives would have changed had this program not existed? And to do that second part of that question, you have to do something more than just follow your clients over time and see what types of changes occur in their life. And this is the heart of what we're doing as an organization and you know, as my research as a professor at Yale is very much dedicated to setting up experimental processes so that we can measure what is the actual impact of a particular type idea. Now, in, um, in the case of microcredit, we have now done rigorous impact evaluations of microcredit. We've done three from researchers in our group, and this, the results that we get from this are striking, and the, re the reaction is actually much more striking, I find. So prior to the research we'd been doing on microcredit, the, the conventional wisdom and the rhetoric on microcredit said it was, it, was, it, was it was almost like it was the panacea to solve poverty, it's the silver bullet, it's going to increase income, increase health, increase education, increase female empowerment in the household, the list goes on. And in what we are finding with the studies is that there were important benefits that were accrued to the families who, rec who, who received access to microcredit compared to a, a, a randomly assigned control group that did not get access to the microcredit. But we did not find that these things solve poverty by any means. Now, the pendulum has swung, and, and it's, fr it's a frustrating thing to see as a researcher when, you're, when your research gets overinterpreted the wrong way, and then people are saying, oh, microcredit's bad. Right? The, the, the results that we're finding is that microcredit does have some benefits, but it's really pointing out very very poignantly that we need to think about opportunity costs. It's not the silver bullet, and if we're doing microcredit, that means our money's not going and doing something else. So what's better? What's the right answer? And so this is the, this is the heart of the first theme. What really works, right? And when, when I left El Salvador, I went back to graduate school because this is what I saw as the biggest gap was this lack of rigor of anal analytics in terms of understanding what the impact was and understanding how programs were designed. So I went back to graduate school to get a PhD in economics to study these types of questions. What I found when I went back to graduate school was with certain exceptions, like my advisors who I was working with, the debate was strikingly frustrating. It, the debate 
was answering the question, does development aid work? Now, this is just a bad question. It, 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 particularly if you're going to expect a yes or no. <laughs> okay. First, the, the, answer in, it, it, the, the, I've, the answer is, first of all, so quite reasonable that some aid works and some aid does not. And uh, how can you argue with that? But yet, that was not the debate that we were seeing was this polar opposite of aid. And it was also this, this very monolithic view of poverty, that we were just measuring poverty at the country level and then asking whether aid flows reduces poverty. And it was, it was a very frustrating set of research to try to absorb and figure out what to do with. And the, the revolution which started taking place in the mid-1990s in development economics was to say, well, let's stop this debate from the ivory tower, from these large cross-country data sets that are, that where the data is aggregated up to a level where we've lost our understanding of what we're really measuring. And let's go to the ground, and by going to the ground, we can set up careful tests and collect data that we actually know what it is, know what it represents, measure the actual changes in people's lives, measure the counterfactual of what would have happened by setting up randomized trials and knowing what happened, what would have happened, and measuring the actual change in people's lives as a result of access to various services or programs or interventions. And this applies to government, NGO, as well as for-profit entities. So that's the, that's the first theme of the book, and, and it, we talk a lot about the, the examples of this type of ground research in microfinance, in health, education, et cetera. The second theme of the book is about behavioral economics, and specifically lessons from behavioral economics that can help us think about how to design better programs, and how behavioral economics changes sometimes ways that we think about things in, in subtle but yet really important ways. So one example which stays true to the microcredit co topic which I already raised is about what we call loans. Do we call a loan credit or debt? Right? So the striking thing about micro loans is that we can take, I can take the same exact loan, the same terms, conditions, interest rates, everything, in a developing country and describe it to you and, and tell you the organization to send money to where you can get a tax deduction for supporting that loan, that creation of that loan. And, and you can get a tax deduction for this under the umbrella of a charity doing good work. And that would be called microcredit. In the US, we can take the same exact loan, and now we'll call it debt, it's the same interest rate, same terms, same conditions. And now, what's, what are the nonprofit organizations going to be doing around that? They're going to be trying to figure out how to get people to not do that, to not take out that loan, to pay it down faster, to not take it out in the first place, or to pass regulation or laws to shut it down so they can't even have the loan if they want it, that the lender's not allowed to make it for them by passing usury laws. Okay, so there's something, you know, there's, there's uh, three ways of thinking about that, you know, reconciling those two things. One is to say, well, we're wrong to be doing it overseas. Those are bad loans for people, and they're making people worse off, and we're right about it in the United States. A second is to say, no, 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 we really should free markets up in the U.S., and yes, maybe we can help people think about the right decision, whether they should be borrowing or saving, but we shouldn't be restricting the market, we should be letting it happen just the same way we do overseas. A third is to say that I'm being loose with my analogy and that the two are, there are other things that are different. And I'll, I'll admit that I am being a little bit loose, but not, not, not so loose as to be, I don't think I'm wrong. There, there is an overlap in these two worlds. Um, there, you know, there are some loans in the U.S. that you wouldn't see overseas and vice versa that are, you know, supported. So, um, now, but that's just an example of word choice making such a powerful difference in how we perceive something. And this is true in a lot of spaces, when we, want to, when we want to figure out how to sell charity or whether we want to sell goods in developing countries, we need to think about that last mile. How do you actually get products into the hands of individuals? Is it as good as just create the intervention and then with that everybody will use it? Or do you have to actually think about how to sell it? Right? In the same way that that word, credit or debt, has a very different meaning to us. Credit is good, we earn credit, you don't earn debt. Right? Debt is bad, that's something we owe, we're indebted to people or indebted to firms, right? So that very, that simple word choice, which has the same actual meaning in terms of economics, you know, it, it puts a very different mindset to us when we think about whether we like it or not, whether it's a good or bad thing, whether we should encourage people or not. One of the other th themes in the book, one of the other behavioral examples in the book is um, one about temptation. 
And how is it that we deal with temptation in life? We all have different things that tempt us. How do we go about figuring out how to resist temptation? And are there ways of offering people products and services that help people resist temptation better so that they can achieve the things they want to achieve? And the fun thing about this one is it's, this is a universal thing, right? We, it's not to say that it's universal what tempts us, obviously. I have different temptations than everybody else in this room, no doubt. Everybody's unique in what it is. And it's, you know, maybe there's someone on this planet who has no temptations, but I haven't met that person yet. So for me, you know, I love peanut M&Ms. And you know, if I could make it so that the peanut M&M company would only sell them to me at a price of $100 a bag, I would actually be really happy. I'd like that. Right? And I would eat many fewer peanut M&Ms. Now, you know, understanding how people deal with temptation solves a few problems all at once. And this is kind of the fun part of thinking through the theory of how people make decisions. We look at a project in the book in, in Kenya in which we use an understanding of temptation and how people manage their money to help farmers invest more in fertilizer to increase yield in their farm. And it's the same principle that we go to the Philippines and we look at a program that we tested that helped people stop smoking. And it's the same type of thinking that takes us to back to America to a website that I started called Stick stickk.com, which uh, one of my co-founders, Ian Ayers, spoke here at, at Google, I think about two years ago, um, and talked about, the, talked about this as well. And it's a website we started in the United States that can help people lose weight, stop smoking, uh, or achieve more success at work or at home, et cetera. So what's the underlying principle is a commitment contract. And, and it's the basic, the basic idea is, how do you make your vices more expensive? How can I make it so that peanut and M&Ms cost me more money? So an example of what I did last night at dinner tells you exactly how this type of thing can work. So last night at dinner, I know if I, my sweet spot when eating a nice meal is to have wine and no dessert. Okay, so if I can plan ahead and achieve exactly what I want to do, I will have wine and no dessert. I do know myself well enough, unfortunately, that after I've had wine, dessert looks much better. Okay, so after I've had my wine, if I then am asked whether I want dessert, a lot of times I'll end up saying yes to the dessert, right? So if I have to rank my preferences, my first choice is wine, no dessert. My second choice is neither. And my third choice is both. Okay, that's me speaking now about my dinner tonight. But I know that if I'm actually eating dinner, that the wine plus dessert will sneak its way to the top, and that'll end up being what I do. So how do, I, how do I solve this? How can I get it so that wine and no dessert ends up being what I actually do? So what I did last night, I was exactly in this setting, and I can do it again, because I'm, I'm here with, with um, two people who I'm going to be having dinner with tonight, and so I will say the same thing to you now. If you see me eating dessert tonight at dinner, I owe you each $1,000. Okay, so now I can eat, drink my wine, and feel confident that I'm not going to order dessert for $2,012.95. Right? $12.95, I will. $2,012.95, no, not going to happen. Okay, so now that's problem solved. So I just wrote a very simple commitment contract. Um, technically, we I, I probably need to like, pay them a dollar. They need to pay me a dollar for it or something like that to make it legally binding. But it's socially binding because I will definitely hear the wrath from them if I don't pay up and eat dessert. And so that's, that's an example of how we're thinking about ways to help people modify behavior towards their own goals, towards things that they preemptively said they want to do. And that's how the STIC website works. You can go online, you write a contract, you say, I'm going to lose weight, stop smoking. Uh, one of my favorite contracts is someone who said, I'm going to um, speak more slowly to foreigners in New York City. Uh, I'm not going to date any more losers, and named one of their friends as a referee who could hold them accountable. Um, so, and then you put money or social shame at stake. So it's a lot of people just put their emails of friends and family who then are informed of whether they succeed or fail. And that might work better for some people than financial stakes. If you put financial stakes, the single most popular option is the George Bush Presidential Library. So the idea being that the money gets zapped away to something that they hate. Now we're not, we're agnostic. We're not taking sides obviously on a, on a political issue. So we give people both. That just tells you something about who happens to be using the site more. But we give the Bill Clinton and the George Bush Presidential Library. And we take five other hot political issues and we give people both sides. And these are called the anti-charities. So you pledge your money to the thing you hate. Um, for people from England or, or UK Premier League fans, you can also choose the major teams, Man U, Arsenal, Chelsea. 
Um, and again, you choose the team you hate and your money will go off to that club. So this is a very simple commitment device, right? You just raised the price, you said what you're going to do, and you put money at stake, and then if you fail, your money goes away. And it's a very simple way of raising the price of vice. Or you can also think of it as lowering the price of virtue. It's the same, it's the same basic formula. Um, okay, so that's, that was theme two. Uh, I now um, want to invite Jay Capel to come on up, who is going to talk about the, the, the third theme of the book, and then I'll, I will wrap up and also plant some ideas with you on some things we want to be doing in the future. Thanks. So, um, yeah, as Dean said, I, I want to talk a little bit uh, more about why this book. So Dean, Dean told you a little bit about what is in this book, and, and I want to say why we um, saw fit to write it. So that sort of brings the focus back to us here as, um, as donors, as practitioners, people who are engaged with the issues of poverty and poverty alleviation. And, and what's the sort of situation that we face? Um, well, a lot of us face a flood of information from charities and from uh, development organizations to, to just try to grab our attention and eventually to try to grab our money. Um, and the, the problem here is that the information calling out to us is not always uh, the right information. It's not, it's not what tells us about which programs are going to be the most effective, which are going to create the biggest change in the world per dollar. Um, more often, it, it goes back to the theme Dean talked about, which is behavioral. So charities are quite savvy. They know how to pull at our heartstrings. They know how to show us photographs of people who are really suffering, fly-bitten babies. They know how to sell us sponsor a child programs where you can, get a, you can make a personal connection with the person that you help. These kinds of um, strategies are really powerful. They, they tug at our heartstrings and they, they really engage us on a personal level. Um, and in a sense, that's great. It's good to be engaged anyhow, but, um, but it's much better to be engaged and, and be thinking proactively about what am I supporting? Where's my money going? At least we think so. So, um, so the ways that charities can can attract our attention um, is by making it either more compelling or, or just easier to give. Um, so, so the one side is these kind of personal stories and the compelling photographs that really arouse our sympathies. Another way is by breaking down the barriers to giving. So that's, that's things like um, in the checkout at Whole Foods, you can give a dollar to the Whole Planet Foundation, so micro credit fund. Um, and when you tack on one dollar to a hundred dollar grocery bill, surprise, surprise, it doesn't hurt so much. It's, it's very easy to give uh, on the margin when you're already spending a bunch of money. Um, along similar lines is the donate by text campaigns that we saw particularly um, after the earthquake in Haiti. So um, there's a, a very funny kind of anecdote to come out of that which, which illustrates a basic point. And that's um, when it's too easy to give, sometimes we make mistakes. We just, we give without thinking. Uh, generally, it's not so bad to make a mistake and have it be charitable, but, um, but it's a mistake nonetheless. So I, I want to just read this anecdote, which we talk about in the book, which um, describes one of these mistakes. It's kind of funny. So this is from, um, from Facebook. So um, giving by text message takes a few seconds and is utterly gratifying. You type in Haiti, press send, get an instant response thanking you for your generosity. You hardly have time to think of the phone bill coming at the end of the month. And when it does arrive, your $10 is easier to part with because it's tacked on to the cost of phone service, a cost you're already prepared to bear. Unless, that is, you are Kara. The following was pulled from, pulled from a real Facebook page. Kara's profile said, I've texted Haiti to 90999 over 200 times. That's over $2,000 donated to Haiti relief efforts. Join me. So she's excited. Then underneath the status update were some comments from, from her friends. And her friend Noah said, your parents might not like your cell phone bill this month. Kara said, it's not my money. Ha, huh? wait a second. This doesn't get added to the phone bill, does it? I thought it was just a free thing. And her other friend says, Kara, shoot, no, every text is $10. Oh, wow, are you sure? This could be very bad for me. He says, yeah, I saw it on the football game. They bill it to your cell phone bill. Another friend chimed in. Yeah, every text is 10 bucks. It said so when the health and human services lady came on and told people about it on Colbert Report. 
Uh, maybe you should ask for people to help you pay your phone bill. And Kara said, well, thanks for letting me know. Ha ha, Haiti must love me. Um, so, so that's kind of the, the point, right? It's, it can be too easy to give. And Kara's $2,000 mistake is not a tragedy in the, in the big picture of the world. It's, it's not a bad thing to give $2,000, even of her parents' money, even by accident. Um, but, but optimally, we could do better, right? We could, we could as, as donors, be a little bit more critical, and we could ask proactively, um, which things do I want to support? A and ideally, we could make that decision on the basis of impacts. So I'd like to use my dollars to make the most, uh, the biggest possible difference in the world on some set of outcomes that I care about. And, um, and so we should look to the evidence of which programs achieve those goals uh, most effectively. And, and so this book is, it, we hope, helps people to do exactly that. Um, so the, the sort of first most basic goal is to get people thinking more critically and more proactively and asking questions. And then um, we close the book, the sort of last chapter is a, a little bit of a, a cheat sheet where we, we name a few ideas that we're particularly excited about which have sort of come out through this process of evaluation um, and they're looking some of them are more proven than others, but in general, evidence shows them to be quite effective. So one caveat there is that um, the book is printed and the ink is dry, but research is always ongoing. So um, the ideas we talk about there mirror uh, an initiative at IPA called the Proven Impact Initiative, where we're, IPA is constantly um, combing through current research and consolidating it into recommendations of ideas, particular approaches, that are shown to be especially effective achieving um, particular outcomes. So, um, so that's something to keep track of too. Um, so that's a little more about the why of this book and now Dean will tie it up. Thanks, thanks Jake. So, um, so I wanna just tie it up by telling you a little bit more on what we're doing on what Jake just said. So Innovations for Poverty Action is a nonprofit that I started in 2002. And we now have projects in 46 countries and um, almost 500 employees, about 250 employees that are US or, or, or European on, on US payroll. And, and about half of our staff are permanent staff, uh, local, local nationals helping to manage our projects overseas. We've grown really rapidly. And part of the reason for that is is there's two reasons why we started, the pro started this in the first place. And one of the reasons for our growth, is that our rapid growth is the first of these reasons. The first was doing this field work is not what we learn to do when we're in graduate school. That's the reality. The reality is we learn in graduate school about theory. We learn about data analysis. Uh, and we do not learn how to manage a team of surveyors. And we do not learn survey design and we do not learn, well, maybe a little survey design, but we do not learn some of the day-to-day the -day management that needs to go into actually going and collecting this field work. Or in many cases, if we're actually working on an intervention, we're working with some group and helping them think through what the actual product is that they're testing. And we're getting involved in that space. And this is not our you know, normal way of doing things in academia. And one of the things that I recognized when I finished graduate school was that we needed an entity that didn't just churn in and out undergrads and grad students for one year, that we needed an entity with a life that had its own internal capacity, its own internal learning that stayed with people. And so that was one of the reasons for creating Innovations for Poverty Action. And what we found very quickly was once we created it and people came, I mean, the researchers really saw the value of this because if they were a researcher at, and did not have that staff and said, oh, well, all of a sudden I want to do a project in Ghana, can you help me? And we said yes, and then we helped them and then, we saw, and then they see that they can take their skill set as professors and then there's this field arm that can really go in and execute very well the field, the field research. It was a great marriage and we, and we grew um, without really trying. Um, merely by doing what we were doing and becoming an organization that groups, that researchers kept coming to us and saying, can you help, can you help, can you help? And, and similarly, foundations kept coming and foundations and saying, wow, we saw this research and we want to do more of it. So we got really good at the knowledge creation side in, in terms of being a conduit uh, for the, the researchers who wanted to do research, the foundations that wanted answers to questions. The 
what do you do with all that information, though? That was one of the other key ahas and inspiring moments for starting Innovations for Poverty Action was recognizing that if I just respond to my academic incentives and other research just respond to their academic incentives, we're not really going to make the, the impact on the world that we want to make. That for many of us is what inspired us to do this type of work. And for that, we needed an organization that is committed to a couple different things. One is to working with, with donors and with organizations to get that information into the right hands. Right? The, the information overload problem that Jake mentioned with Cara and the things being shouted at us, this is about donors, but it's also about the people who work for Oxfam, work for CARE. How do they sift through it all to figure out what's really going to work and what they should be doing? So the problem is on, on many levels. And so that's where the, the information dissemination is so important for us as an organization to work. And with, with donors, small and medium, and, as well as large. But the large donors, that's a conversation that as professors we're often engaged in anyhow. Conversations with the World Bank and, and Gates Foundation and groups like that. But we're not engaged as a professor with conversations with people who are, are in running small, medium-sized family foundations or, or even smaller retail uh, type, type audience. So, so it's that, that communication work and that outreach to organizations that's so important to what we're doing now and, and one of the main areas that we're pushing to grow as an, as an organization. Now, um, so I want to close with giving you three ideas. Uh, this is, I talked with a couple of people who, who, who told me that it's really important when talking with people at, at Google to um, not just talk and say, ooh, ooh, look at what we, look at this book and this is what we found, but to, to try to throw out some, some ideas to the, to, the, to the audience to say, here's an example of, of very proactive things that, that we're looking for help to do to see if there's anybody that's interested in, in help. So, let me give you one. So one is, what's striking to us is we are, we are an organization that's, we're, we're dead without data. And, and by dead without data, I also mean we're dead without a good way of collecting data. When I first started doing survey work, it was pen and paper. And that was how we did it. We went out, we printed paper, you know, we go out and we collect it, and then someone sat there and did data input, and, and that's how we did it. We're now seeing in the world, there's a lot of different kind of bootstrap things that are going on, and a lot of different platforms that are incomplete, but that are trying to solve this data collection problem of having surveyors go out into the field and, and gather data that gets then fed back to us. But there's not a really good platform for doing this that really cuts across all of the various needs and, and, and types of circumstances that we find ourselves in. And we're not unique in this. There's other groups that, that value this too. This is not just a research tool. There's a lot of organizations that need this type of data for their own internal monitoring and accountability. And, and, and so how, how is that, what's the right platform for that? And so we, We've grappled with a few pieces of software that are out there, but nothing ever kind of fits the, fits the, fits the, the total answer. Um, a second thing that is, that, that is related to, to what I was talking about um, to earlier about opportunity costs. One of the things that's striking to me is how many people I, I talk to that say that they have intentions for giving to charity that, that don't, but then when you look at what they actually do, they don't quite live up to what they said they're going to do. And this is not much different than the temptation story that I was talking about earlier. You say you're going to do some things, then you get tempted away by other things, and then you look at your bank account, you're making your charitable donation, and you don't have as much in that bank account as you thought you were going to have. And so you end up making less than was originally intended. How how do we go about making that, that link more, more salient between consumption and, and charity? So one, there's an example from my, that I experienced that I, can, that I think tells a lot about this. So I was in, I was in Peru, and I have a al jacket that I bought in Peru about eight years ago that's made of alpaca wool, and it has holes in it now. And so I'm back in Peru for the first time in a while, and I'm thinking, oh, this would be nice to go get a new jacket because I'm sick and tired of walking down the street and having someone chase me down saying, sir, your wallet, you dropped your wallet, right, because there's too many holes in my pocket. And, tr and what's embarrassing, that that's happened more than once, right? You think once would be enough, but no, right? But regardless, so I'm there and I'm thinking, okay, you know, maybe I should go ahead and get another jacket. So I go into a store, which I think is where I bought it eight years ago, and the jacket was $300. Now that's a bit more than I would typically spend on a jacket. I'm not the type of person who spends money on clothing. And I'm 
So I'm first thinking maybe this wasn't the store, maybe I just came into the store and bought it somewhere else. And so I'm shopping around and I'm not finding a jacket that I like that's, for, that, that's made of alpaca that's less than 300. And then I thought to myself, okay, do I really need this jacket? Right, I, I have a jacket, it wasn't the alpaca one, I had another one that was just a simple North Face jacket um, that I like. Do I really need this second jacket? And then I thought to myself, well, what's the opportunity cost? What, what, what else would I do with $300? What else could $300 do? Well, the simple trade-off is 60 bed nets. Right? On average, will 60 bed nets save a child's life? I don't know the exact math, but let's say roughly yes. So I thought to myself, okay, great. That's a better choice. Right? It is a clear choice. I can't spend the $300 on both. It's not the, we're not talking the, the Kennedy silver bolt magic bullet here that can go through both things. Right? So it's either or. So I made the choice on the bed nets. Did I send the money off to the bed net place when I got home? No, haven't done it yet. Not explicitly. So why not? Why, what if I was able to have a platform at that very moment that I could just send an email, log into the website, where I make that transfer salient. I make that mental account very clear that I am foregoing this item specifically in order to support a particular cause. And now I'm holding myself accountable by having this, this mental accounting process that is now on this platform. And I can, you can have, imagine many ways of, of feeding information into it. You can imagine f having social networks that, that agree on common consumption goods to give up. Maybe, maybe it's the daily latte that when you add it up for the entire year, you go, my gosh, really, I'm spending $2,000 a year on lattes? You know, maybe that's something I could give up and $2,000 can do something else. So, so the tool can do a lot to help people see the salience of what they're giving up. And, and, you know, and this might inspire more giving. For some, maybe it wouldn't, but for those who want to aspire to be more charitable in, in their trade-offs, it would be a tool for helping them see and make that, sal make that trade-off very salient. So there's, there's an analogy that comes from Peter Singer. He's a philosopher at Princeton that tells a lot, that, that, that makes this analogy exactly perfectly. The analogy is you're walking down the street and there's a child drowning in a lake and you're on your way to a meeting. And if you jump in that lake to save that child, you're going to miss that meeting and let's say for simplicity that meeting is going to earn you $300. So you have a trade-off right now, $300 or the child. Most people would say that there's an ethical obligation, for, certainly for people who are of, of modest uh, capabilities and financially, to forego the $300 and save that child's life. Okay, so now, right now in Africa, same logic can apply. Go, I can give you the names of 20 different organizations that are immunizing children or passing out bed nets, $300, child's life, it's the same exact trade-off. There is one key difference, and this goes back to the first theme of this entire, the entire book. So a lot of people respond, and I'm willing to bet that a lot of people in this room right now are saying to me, no, 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 Dean, you're wrong. It's not the same. You told me that I can save that child, and I know how to swim, and so I will save that child. But how do I know that the $300 is going to save the child in Africa? How do I really know that? Right? And that's one of the reasons for doing this type of data work, this type of evaluation, is to remove some, at least some of that uncertainty, so that you know that $300 can actually make a difference, and here's how to do it. And that's one of the motivations for doing it. And also, what the other message from that analogy is about the salience of what we're giving up. And, and the key is, how can we create an app or a tool to help people think more concretely about the, trace, the, the choices they make in life so that they can adhere to the, the value system that they say they have? And how can we make the data actually help people fit the values that they claim to have and want to have? So that's, that's something that I'm very excited about. And if there's people here that would be interested in doing that, please, by all means, um, let, me, let me know. There's one other twist to that lake analogy, just to, just to fill the loop in, so if you ever, wanna, if you ever talk about that, it's just, you, what you, the other thing to do is to, to make it so that you can't swim, okay? But there's a lifesaver on the other side of the lake. And then ask yourself, do you have an ethical obligation to miss that meeting, to go all the way to the other side of the lake, find that lifesaver, throw it into the lake, and hope you hit the child? Well, not hit them on the head, hopefully, and not pass them out, but, but hit them, you know, get it near the child, right? So now what have I done? I've made both of them a, a uncertain event. You may save the child with the lifesaver. You may save the child in Africa. Don't know about either. 
right? So that, that's another way of changing that analogy to kind of wreak havoc with, with why people answer them differently. Okay, the third thing, just to let you know, in terms of how IPA is structured, so, right, so we, don't, we do a lot of projects where an organization comes to us and says, please tell us if, we're, if this works, we'd like to have, see an evaluation, and a donor comes to us and says, we want to know if that works, we're supporting that, and we want to know whether we should support more of it. And so please do a, an evaluation of the pilot so that we can see whether we should scale it up. And we, lo we like those projects. But the projects that we really love, that have much bigger impact in terms of numbers, is when we can take a step back, working with the donors, working with the organizations doing things, and saying, what are the questions that you need answering in order to crack this nut? And now how can we set up evaluations and, and experiments that help answer those types of problems? And that's when we, we have initiatives that have pots of money, usually ranging from two to, two to $10 million, where we then have an ability to take a step back and say, we need research that's going to answer these five questions. And then we open it up to researchers to propose specific settings in which they think they can nail one of these five questions. And then we use this process uh, to facilitate the funding of, of research to answer particular questions. So for instance, the small medium enterprise market is a huge market that we see a lot of stagnation, a lot of lack of growth. And that's where jobs can get created. The, the term entrepreneur for micro, in microcredit, to bring us back to the microcredit conversation, is a very sexy term to most people in America. I mean, certainly, I'm guessing to everybody in this room, it it's, is to me, right? Entrepreneur is exciting. It's not, in, in developing countries, entrepreneur is synonymous with I don't have a job. Right? That's a very different beast. Right? And, it, and it's really a misplaced goal to say that microenterprise growth the goal of microenterprises is to grow microenterprises into small, medium enterprises. We want to take people with zero employees and somehow figure out how to get them 10 or 20 or 100 employees. That, that's, a, that's a diamond in the rough. But there are, there are firms out there that are, in, that are hiring some, not too many. And then the question is, what's hindering their growth? They've, they've gotten over the hurdle of the zero employee to some employees. Now, what, what's necessary to get them bigger so that they can create more jobs? That's a huge nut that we're trying to crack. So other ones that are in that space are on the saving side. When we've seen the lackluster, the positive, but still not, not super exciting results on impact of credit, that's focused our energy a lot to ask, well, what about savings? Savings, you don't have the higher interest rates. You're, and what do we need to do then to help people save up to things that they want to do? And so we have an initiative that is about savings. Uh, similarly, there's, there's a lot of work that we've talked about. We've thought about having an initiative on mobile, on mobile apps. There's a huge number of interventions that, that we can talk about that are interesting and exciting, but at the same time, we wonder, okay, is this just exciting because it's kind of cool, or is it actually going to improve welfare in a way that's important? And so, you know, how can technology be used to improve people's lives in, in rural areas in Africa, or Latin America, Asia? Um, and again, there, it, we wouldn't, you know, we want to be able to take the approach of rather than just finding a particular thing and evaluating it, we want to be able to step back and understand, well, what are, the, what are the key overarching questions we have to ask? You know, one obvious one is, can the technology alone do something or when do we have to think about combining technology with a human touch in terms of the way things are integrated into a development program? And so those uh, better understanding of how that ha interaction has to take place in order to make sure that technology is used for good is an important question that we want to ask. And so that's an example where we're looking for a pot of funds that we can then work creatively to help answer the questions that the, the researchers, the researchers in this case, what I mean is the technology researchers and the organizations and the donors are, are looking for answers to these questions in order to know what to, what to scale up and whatnot. Um, so, um, so with that, I, I will turn it to Q&A. If you have questions, please uh, come up to the mic so that uh, the remote sites and the uh, recording can get your question. Thank you. It was a really good talk. Um, my question is regards to, well, a couple points you brought up. When you were talking about, you know, how easy it is to give and how basically the message I took was it's important to research and make a good economic choice about where you put your money and make sure that it works. But how do you reconcile that with basically government charity where I really can't choose particularly where my money goes. It's taken from me and it goes into some giant hole and policy-wise, things don't change very rapidly. If something's discovered not to work, 
they can't change it very quickly either. How do those kind of reconcile those two viewpoints? So, I mean, there is, so, I mean, so clearly, I mean, we don't have a, I, I've heard people make proposals of, of, of a taxation system where we actually get to choose allocations. I, I, I actually think that might be a dangerous thing. Having said that, there, there is a lot of work and a lot of, of our researchers uh, are working in the developing countries when we, when we work. We are working with USAID or Millennium Challenge Corporation, which are two US government agencies, to help use this type of evaluation to help them direct their resources to better decisions. The Department of Education, Department of Labor have been doing rigorous type randomized trials for a long time. Actually, the first randomized trials in economics that were done were in the 1960s by the US government. So I'm not saying that it's like everything fits that bill by any means. I don't want to pass that. But I think the answer is the same. And it's not, but I wouldn't put that in the hands of the, the taxpayer. Right? That's in the hands of, of the executive branch of the government and Congress to say, let's take evaluation more seriously in how we think about what we're doing. And there are a lot of, there are a lot of government programs which do do that. And obviously, there's a lot that do not. Yeah, but I guess my question is, from a government perspective, they get the money. Where's their incentive to provide this proof of value to us? So there is, okay, so there is, look, there is a, there's a political risk that, that obviously a lot have overcome, but, you know, nobody wants their program to appear like a failure. So you, you have to, as a politician, really promote the, the point that you are, you are exercising prudence in, in making sure that you choose the right thing. And the, the look, the look, just as a matter of fact, there are a lot of randomized trials done on government funding projects. So, it, I mean, it is just in terms of looking at the way the world does work, this has been overcome in a lot of situations. And there are a lot of government programs which do go through that. By any means, I'm not trying to say there's yeah. like enough, I think more should. Um, but it is the case that there's a lot of government funded programs that receive that. Millennium Challenge Corporation is a good example of one that from the day one of that group, I'm not saying everything, I like everything they do, but one thing they have taken very seriously is, let's, you know, when we can, we want to see randomized trials done to evaluate our aid. And that was done from day one. And USAID is really moving in that direction. We'll see, it's a big ship, it needs moving. But the people they, that Obama brought in at the top are really dedicated to introducing strong evaluations to help guide their resources. So, you know, where there's, where there's will, there's a way. And you, there, is a, you know, there is a message that needs to be managed because if the evaluations start proving that everything failed, they have to make sure from the political messaging to get their, get their PR people kind of figuring out how to deal with that problem to make sure that the message is that like, hey, we learned it didn't work and we changed our decision because of that because we're smart and we learn. I'd like to think that's how the world could work. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Hi, um, thanks, first of all. This was really fascinating. Uh, my question to you is uh, related to how, I mean, we as Google and, and you as uh, maybe an academic, like maybe kind of an academic institution love to see data. But if we asked like nonprofits on the ground um, who are doing great work, would they see randomized trials and sort of building counterfactuals as a, um, a sort of non-immediate achievement of their goals and sort of using resources maybe for an academic exercise where they could have been used for um, direct impact as right. they see it, right? So let me separate your question into two parts. There's, there's a question, there's an ethics question, which I think about a lot, which is should we be doing evaluation? Should we be doing research on something? Right? If there's an organization and we know it's doing well, should we, should we be doing any research on them or should they just be taking all of their available resources and doing more? And that's not a question about randomized trials or other research. That's just a question about should they be doing research? Are there questions that they need answers to that we're actually informing them on? Or, you know, or if they already have the answers, then why are we wasting our time and their money? And that's, that's an ethics issue. But that's about the question of just research versus not. It's not a question about randomized trial or not. Now, there's a second issue, which is random, randomized trials does, and not all, there are many situations in which we can do randomized trials and we basically leave the organization alone. And they, they really change very little about what they have to do that is intrusive. But by all means, there are some times where it is intrusive to what they're doing. And then, you know, then the organization has to ask themselves, well, you know, if I'm using the evaluation to make forward-looking decisions, like, what are those forward-looking decisions? How important are they? 
how much future resources are at stake here that we make sure we get it right. The minute evaluation is used to look forward rather than to look back, it becomes a much more appetizing process. Because we realize that it's not about saying, are these million dollars being spent well? But it's saying, we're about to spend 100 more million dollars in the next 20 years, and how should we best spend that money? And the minute that's the right mindset, it becomes a very exciting process for everybody because they start realizing the incredible power that the research can have in helping them maximize their impact. The other thing to note is there are many situations we deal with where the for-profit firm or a non-profit firm could behave exactly like a for-profit. There are lots of for-profits, as you all know here at Google, that run randomized trials all the time. They just don't post, share the data necessarily with, with dorky academics like me to go write papers. So there's a lot of situations where the nonprofit could behave exactly like the, like the for-profit, running internal randomized trials to help improve their operations. And, and then the partnership with academia in, in some of those situations is a little bit of a quid pro quo called, it's like we're giving free consulting advice in exchange for data. They're agreeing to let their results be made public in exchange for the free consulting advice. And so there's a, there, that, that often does, we do, we, I have been involved in exchanges that are more or less of that nature. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for coming to talk to us. Um, I was wondering if there was um, a mechanism that you had thought of in, in terms of that one uh, philosophical problem that you posed earlier about a child drown drowning in the lake. I think often, or at least one major reason people might think of is, well, someone else is going to save them. Um, is there kind? Of, I mean, have you kind of explored that mechanism of kind of social versus individual responsibility, and you know how that kind of all ties together and you know, you, you came up with a lot of kind of like opportunity cost type individual right. responsibility scenarios, but you know, is there one that kind of captures this, this kind of problem, I say? So, I mean, I totally agree that that, I mean, I've definitely, that is a common reaction to, the, to that. And, and there's a couple, so I have two thoughts for you. One is I'm gonna change the analogy on you in order to still make the opportunity cost fine, which is, okay, so fine, there's three other people standing by the side of the lake. What, are you not gonna jump? <laughs> Are you really going to just walk away because there's three other people not jumping in either? Yeah, I think it's right? So, but, so, but there, is, there is an element there where there's, you know, now I've made it both the same. And the point is there are many situations in, in developing countries where the equilibrium is what it is. And the situation right now is very simple. $300 can save a child's life, right? And so the fact that there's a billion people out there that could also send $300 is neither here nor there. The equilibrium right now is, is what it is, and on the margin, you're making a trade-off. Now, the, you know, like I said, the, my, my other favorite way of dealing with it is to just you know, put a mob of people on the side of the lake and, and ask whether the ethical thing is to just stand there even if nobody else is moving. Um, and most people would say no. You, know, either you might look around a little and hope someone else goes in first, but at the end of the day, are you really gonna just not go? Um, now, I think the other, the other takeaway I have from, the, from your from your question when I think about this is, is, is what it tells us about how we, how we can be motivating giving. So I go back to the, to the, to the website app that I want to see created. And I think there's a lot of lessons to learn from that exact question you posed about ways to make that app better, ways to incorporate a social dimension to it so that people don't feel like they can, can free ride and they really make it salient that no, your action and your action alone can do this and others aren't going to do it, and you can't just rely on others. And I think that, 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 that kind of question you posed is something that gives me, I, you know, there's specific things within that app that one might want to test in order to figure that out more. Yeah. Hi. Um, I, as a small-time donor, I think that um, it's really great to be able to feel like the dollars I'm putting in are doing good. And so I was really excited when I discovered uh, GiveWell. I was wondering if you know of other organizations like that that are helping to, um, I guess, take your academic work and make it more accessible to people like me. Right. No, and so um, there's one domestically which I'm I, I've heard, familiar with, but not as well, not as much as GiveWell called Root Cause. Uh, there's GuideStar is 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 changing. It, it's 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 going to be new soon. We actually just met with some people yesterday, and they are trying to trying to incorporate information from groups like GiveWell, GuideStar, I'm sorry, GiveWell, Root Cause, Innovations for Poverty Action, and, and figure out how to get that out to people. I think the, um, you know, the challenge is that, you know, you, as a donor, you want to be, you know, there's a very simple formula that you're trying to solve. 
you're trying to maximize A times B. A is, does the idea work? Does the idea of what the program is doing, is it the right idea in that place, in that context? And B is, do they do what they say they're going to do? So, you know, they say they're doing bed nets, great, but, you know, you sent $1,000 or $10,000, how many bed nets actually got into the hands of individuals? Right? And what you want to do as a donor is multiply those two together and maximize it. A zero in either and you're out of luck. Right? Now, the book and, and our work is very focused on that first. There is some of work that we're now starting to do about the second to try to understand more about transparency and governance of NGOs. But it, it's much further back. One, one of the nice things about groups like GiveWell is they're trying to tackle both at the same time. The other way of dealing with it is to think about projects. And this is why we started the Proven Impact Fund um, that Jake mentioned. And this is saying, well, the, the organizational assessment is, is a tricky beast. What, what's much easier to say is, this organization in that particular location we know is doing a particular project and we know what they're doing, and so let's go fund that project. And that's an easier beast to, to, um, to think through and to, and to analyze than an entire organization where you don't know, okay, I know this organization's one project in Ethiopia is good, but they have 17 other programs. Can I assume that there's an overall organizational effectiveness or not? And so, you know, the two approaches, and, I, and I'm not sure which is the, the right one in the long run. I can just tell you that we're taking with the Proven Impact Fund the project approach of saying, is the idea proven? And then here are some projects we know that are doing this. Um, I, I do like the other two. I, I, I think the world is good with both. Um. Well, we've come to the end of our time. Uh, everyone, uh, please join me in thanking okay. Dean and Jacob for coming. Great. Come on up, sir. Thank you, everyone. It was great to be here.